Baptism is a symbol of what Jesus did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Being lowered in the water represents our old life dying. Life dying. Just as Jesus was dead and buried, our past and future sins are gone forever. We are forgiven. We are forgiven. When we are raised out of the water, it represents our new life in Christ. Just as Jesus was resurrected, we are a new, are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has the come. New has come. Today, today we celebrate as people take, take their next step. step and tell the world that Jesus has brought them from death to life. To life. To life. Today we celebrate the miracle of a changed life based upon their profession in Jesus Christ. In the name, in the name of, the Father, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are buried with Christ and raised to, and walk. Raised to walk in newness of life. Newness of life. You know, as a Christian church, evangelical Christian church, there are two ordinances that we practice. An ordinance is something that Jesus commanded us to do. And there are two that we continue to practice, and those are communion and baptism. And so we, when it comes to communion, we see that these were established in the Gospels, communion and baptism by Jesus, instituted in the Gospels. Um, he commanded his disciples to observe communion, and to baptize new followers. When it comes to communion, we know on the night that he was betrayed, just before he went to the cross, in the upper room, he was with his disciples. And we know that he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this. Participate in communion. Break bread and drink this cup. In remembrance of me, he said. So communion has its place, and we do that the first Sunday of every month. One of those ordinances or commands. But along with that, baptism is something that we obey. Jesus himself, as an example, was baptized. You'll remember that John was in the Jordan River. He was baptizing people. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up to John. And John looks at him and he says, hold on, wait a minute. I, I don't need... I don't want to baptize you. I need to be baptized you. And Jesus looked at John, and this is what he said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus gave us an example. He himself was baptized. He wasn't a sinner in need of forgiveness of sins, but he did this as an example for us. And so when it comes to baptism, Jesus he came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now this is just before, Matthew 28, right? Just before he's going to ascend, he's talking to his disciples. And he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says, lo, I am with you, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the ages. So these folks were established by Jesus. These were things that he in the Gospels asked his disciples to be about. More than 2,000 years ago, communion and baptism, how important these things are. So they are established in the Gospels by Jesus, and then I want you to see that they are then obeyed in the Acts, the book of Acts, by Jesus' disciples. He told them to do this, and we see in the book of Acts, they obeyed his commands. When it comes to communion, we read in Acts 2.42, they, the church, the disciples, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, which is the communion supper, the communion gathering, and he says ultimately to prayer. So Jesus established it, and then we see in the book of Acts the disciples obeying communion, but let's get to baptism. Those who accepted his message, it says, were baptized. Now, this is the day of Pentecost. This is when Peter came down out of that upper room and began to preach to all of the crowds of people that were, that were there from all over in that time as they came to the day of Pentecost. 
And Peter began to preach one of the most amazing messages ever. And the Bible says that that day, 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's why it says they were baptized and 3,000 were added to their number, the number of the church, that day. It was established in the Gospels. These ordinances were then obeyed in the Acts. And folks, finally, we read that they are explained in the epistles, the letters of Paul. These are explained. Why do we do this? What is communion all about? And here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He was writing to the church of Corinth. And Paul says to that church, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Paul is reiterating this. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, again, in remembrance of me. And I love this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Folks, every first Sunday of each month when we take those communion elements, we are declaring that we believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. We are going to continue to remember his sacrifice on the cross until he returns for his church. Amen? Amen. I have said that over and over. We will always take communion as a church. For whenever you drink this bread and eat this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So he explains the power of that. And then baptism. Hold on. I'm going to talk about what that means in a minute. But I want to ask and answer the question then. Who should be baptized? We see that it was established by Jesus. We see then that it was obeyed by the apostles, by the early church in the book of Acts. But who is it that should be baptized? And this is an important question. If you go back and look at those 3,000 that day that accepted Christ in Acts 2.41, it says they believed and then they were baptized, right? They heard Peter's words. They believed and then they were baptized. And then a great story in Acts chapter 10. This is the story about a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius was a uh, Roman soldier. He was a centurion, actually. And Cornelius had a, a vision. An angel came and said to him, Hey, I got a guy. He, he, his name is Peter. I want you to send for him because he's got a message for you. And so Cornelius, he had servants. He sent for Peter to come. And, and, and Peter came and Peter shared. But just before Peter came and shared, Peter had his own vision, if you know this story. Peter had a vision of all these unclean animals being dropped down and the Lord saying, go ahead and eat. And Peter says, never, Lord. I, I, I've never eaten anything unclean. I've never had bacon. Poor Peter. He's never had bacon, right? But at this point, God says, that's okay. And the whole point of that was not about bacon or unclean foods necessarily. It was the fact that God was now going to include the Gentiles in the thing called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter shows up at Cornelius' house. Peter shares an amazing story. And the Bible says that Cornelius and his family believed. And as soon as they saw, the disciples saw that the Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles... Peter says this, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then it says they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. They believed and then they were baptized. You probably can get what I'm driving at here. One more cool story. Paul is in the city of Philippi. And Paul and his buddy Silas were arrested in the city of Philippi. And they were arrested for a whole thing. You can read it on your own, Acts chapter 16. But as they were there, they were singing and praising God in prison. Isn't that a cool picture? They're in prison, but they're singing and praising God. And as they're singing and praising God in prison, the Bible says that there was an earthquake, that the whole jail cell broke open, and all of the soldiers were free, and the jailer who was supposed to be guarding all of these jail cells, he sees all the prisoners going free and he knows what's going to happen to him because they're all free. He's going to lose his life. 
So the Bible says he began, started to take his life, was ready to take his life. And Peter says, hold on, stop. And ultimately, this guy, the Philippian jailer, he accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And then it says, he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I jumped the gun. Now he's asking to be saved. And they replied, here's what you got to do. Be baptized, right? That's how you get saved. No. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, Peter and Silas. Then immediately he and all his, excuse me, I say it's Peter, it's actually Paul, right? I saw you guys checking me. I know, yeah. Paul and Silas. I'm not trying to lead you all astray here this morning. Paul and Silas, immediately he washed their wounds, and he and all his household were what? Then they were baptized. Who should be baptized? Folks, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And why that's important is because we don't want anyone to think that here today anyone's getting saved as they jump in this, this tank. They've already accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've always, already asked him to forgive them of their sins. And the Bible says after that, then we're baptized. And so just let me just say, if you've ever heard of infant baptism, there's no biblical precedent for infant baptism because an infant has not put their faith in Jesus Christ yet. It's only after we've trusted Christ for life, recognized that we're sinners in need of a Savior, that we allow ourselves to be dunked in this water. That's who should be baptized, people who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, finally, what does baptism mean? This is important because it has a lot of meaning, and here's what I want you to know. Baptism is an outward sign, a physical outward sign, of an inward spiritual reality. Let me say that again. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward spiritual reality. Reality. If you got Bibles and if you want to, turn to Romans chapter 6. Here's where Paul tells us the most concise idea of what baptism is all about. Verse 3, Paul says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Who says amen to that this morning? That's good news. For we know that our old self, read that, our old sinful person, your old sinful man, your old sinful woman, your old sinful self was crucified with him, put to death with Jesus so that the body ruled by sin, read that, the flesh, and all of us folks live in this stuff called the flesh, the sarks, the carnal nature, so that, he says, we, the body ruled by sin, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Folks, in the same way, he says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So I said it's a picture, an outward sign of an inward reality. And according to Paul, it's a picture of us, what happened to each and every one of us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. What happened to you spiritually? The Bible says that you were put to death with Christ, literally, and that's going down into the water. This is a picture of being put to death with Christ. This is a picture of everything 
being buried, total submersion, which is why we don't sprinkle. We totally submerse because it's like you're being put to death and then you're buried and all your old sin, your sinful person is done away with and then the Bible says you are resurrected, coming up out of the water. So it's really a picture, just as Jesus was put to death, buried and rose again, it's a picture of us being put to death being buried in Christ, all of our sin being done, and then raising up out of this water a new creation in Christ. The best way we could picture it, and I always say this, is if we went to a graveyard, if we dug a grave, and we said, all right, jump in, you're dead, right? That's what a graveyard, you're dead, all your old sin is done away with. Now jump up out of that grave because now you're alive spiritually again in Christ. That would be the best picture. The problem is we would get arrested. So we don't do that. Instead, we use this water as a plane that we can break, like going down beneath the earth and then coming up out of that brand new creations in Christ. And that's really, folks, why Paul said this in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Baptism is a picture of you spiritually coming alive together as a believer in Jesus Christ. Because we're all born dead in our sins, Paul says, right? Nobody is born a believer. Nobody is born a Christian. People say it all the time. Well, I, I, I was born a Christian or I grew up in the church, so that makes me... No, nope. doesn't matter where you were born. doesn't matter what you grew up in. What matters is we're all sinful. And the Bible says we all need to be born again spiritually. And the only way you and I are going to be born again spiritually is by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our lives, asking him to forgive us of our sins and confessing him as your Lord and Savior. And all the people today that are being baptized have done that very thing, and that is awesome. So it's a symbol, a picture. But I also want you to know baptism is a public statement. This is a public statement that the old sinful person, the old man, the old woman and their ways, their sinful ways are done away with, Romans 6, 6 says. And now that person is raised to walk, to live a brand new life in Jesus Christ. You now belong to Jesus Christ and you have things that he wants you to do. Your life, the Bible says, is not your own and that's why 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, she, they are a new creation. Isn't that an amazing statement? You are not the same person you were before you asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. You are a new creation in Christ. And the Bible says, the old has gone. Read that, the old sinful person, the old slave to sin, the old slave to your flesh. That's gone, and the Bible says, behold, all things have become what? Brand new. I know that's not what that says, but it is what another version says, and it's my favorite. That's what I memorized. The old has gone, and behold, all things have become brand new. And when you see this person coming up out of the water, folks, they are a new creation in Christ. They're no longer a slave to sin. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are no longer slaves to fear, and this world is full of fear. We are slaves to one thing, servants of one person, slaves and servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That is good news, and that's what this is all about. And finally, folks, baptism is a symbol. It is a symbol, an outward sign of an inward reality. It really pictures the past. It pictures putting to death the old sinful person, again, the water, grave, going down, and then it pictures the present now and even your future desire to now live for Jesus Christ with your life, to serve him and honor him. That's what this is all about. So I want to say this. This is important, baptism is. But I want you to know again that baptism does not save us. We are saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our life, by confessing our sin to him. And if you want to quibble about it, Probably one of the greatest examples of how we know this is true is one, because the Bible tells us so. So boom, mic drop, done. But also, what about the thief on the cross? 
The thief on the cross, one of the criminals who hung there, hurled insults at him. Hey, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Remember, there were two, one on each side. But the other criminal on the other side rebuked that other criminal. He said, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, that would be the sentence of death, we are punished because we deserve it justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, this would be the good thief on the cross. Jesus, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That was an aha moment for this guy. That was an epiphany. This is not just an average man. This is no criminal. This is God in the flesh. And he, when he breathes his last, is going to enter his kingdom. And he says, can I come too? And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Out of the words, out of the mouth rather of Jesus. Was he baptized? It wasn't even raining. He was not baptized, but he was in the kingdom of God with the Lord. And you know what, folks? Baptism is beautiful, and baptism is a reminder that we are saved by grace through faith. Not because we deserve it, not because we earned it. It is nothing that we have done. It is salvation, the gift of God, not by works. Read that even not by good works. Read that even not by baptism so that no one can boast. We are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by any works. That's important because we are saved by grace and we get baptized to make a statement to all of our family and friends, I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm one of them. Count me as a part of his kingdom. Yeah, I'm going to live for Jesus. And that's what these folks today are doing. And we want to applaud them for that. Very cool. So, with that said, if I could get all of you baptizees to come on up here, I hope you all have the cool shirts on. If you don't, we're going to throw one at you. Where's your shirt? You got it on. I see it. Come on up. We're going to get you over here. We're going to have you guys line up right over here, this way. The band is going to come up, and we are going to have a worship celebration as we watch these people be baptized. So if you have family or friends, we've got these things. We've got cameras going to be all over here. This is all going to be live streamed. It will be saved on our website. But if your family member is being baptized, please, by all means, um, come on up and uh, feel free to take pictures right around here. Yeah, I got to go change too. So Charles, lead us in a song and then I'm going to come back after I change. I'm going to sing this song. It's called Reckless Love. Maybe you've heard it before. I'm going to ask you to sing with us. And um, it's a wonderful song about the transforming power of God. You know, it says that Jesus leaves the 99 to go find the one lost sheep. Anyone here ever been that lost sheep? Just me? I was so lost, you guys. I was so lost. And then uh, Jesus sent some people to rescue me. I'm so thankful. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your
was your foe. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, when I felt no
thank you, Lord, for what you're doing today. Hallelujah. Let the fruit of this day last forever in each one of these lives, oh God. Hallelujah. No longer slaves. No longer a slave to sin. Hallelujah. The song says, I'm no longer a slave, but I'm a child of God. Come on, let's sing this over these people getting baptized. This is an anthem. Hallelujah. You unravel me with the melody. Hallelujah. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies for all my fears are gone. Sing it, church. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. mother's womb from my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name and I've been born again into your family thank you Lord your blood flows through my veins come on say with me
Let your waters wash over me. Let your waters wash over me. All my sins are washed away, and I'm no longer a slave to fear. Come on, church. I am a child of God. He's done something brand new in me. I'm no longer a slave to sin or the fear of man. I am a child.
I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Come on. For the battle belongs. Come on, we're seeing some victories today. in Jesus. New life in Jesus. Thank you, God. Victory. No weapon may be formed, but it may prosper. It won't. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Come on. Yes, my God will never
And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of Come on, let's stand and sing this. I'm no longer a slave to fear. This is our anthem. I am, keep looping it, a child of God. Raise your hands up to the Lord in a statement and a symbol. Today was about symbols. And we want to symbolize our lives yielded to you, Jesus. Our lives surrendered to you. Thank you for this group of people that today made this public statement in front of all of their family and friends, all over the internet, and most importantly to you, seated on your throne in heaven, that they belong to you. Amen that they have surrendered their lives to you. And Jesus, we know that that's not just a one-time deal, but that's a continual cry for you, from you, for each of us, that we would surrender daily to you. And so we do that very thing. And I pray for anyone in this room or watching online who has never confessed you as their Lord and Savior. Watching this, I know the Holy Spirit can move in powerful ways. And so if you're watching or if you're in this room and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you're ready to surrender, to confess your sins, you don't have to clean up your life to come to God. We come to God just as we are and He cleans up our lives. Amen. And what you just witnessed was a whole lot of people not cleaning up their lives because this is just water, but you've witnessed people who have confessed Jesus and He is cleaning up their lives. He is changing who they are. And so if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, then I want to invite you right where you stand with your hands lifted high that you would pray this prayer with me. You can pray these words out loud. You can pray these words quietly. You can pray them in your mind. We call it the sinner's prayer, but pray this prayer with me if you want to give your life to Christ today. Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. Jesus, today I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And I ask that you would come into my life and that you would be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you for loving me. And the whole church said, Amen. Real quick. Yeah, let's give the Lord a big hand. Let's give all these folks.